What if ultimately you were aligning your interests with customers? It's one of the fastest growing businesses ever. And it just took off like a, like a, a rocket. Ramp is one of the fastest growing businesses ever to go from zero to $100 million. Uh, and they did it in less than three years. Their last round valued them at over $8 billion. Uh, and it's a great product and a great company. Cambridge actually runs on Ramp. And I never thought I would say this about corporate expense management software, but it's actually pretty magical. So uh, without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome the founder, Eric, here to the program. So Eric, welcome. Thanks, Rex. It's great to be here. Before we dive into Ramp, I would love to back up and understand more about your entire entrepreneurial journey, everything from growing up in Las Vegas to starting Paribus, which is helping consumers save money, to lots of other things, and eventually um, you know, going off and starting Ramp to help businesses manage their expenses. I was born and raised in, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, uh, lived there for 18 years. My biggest memory there about the city was it just... Um, it grew really, really quickly. In 1990, when, when I was born, there was something like four or 500,000 people. And, and 18 years later, there was something like 2 million. And I later went out into college out in Boston, and uh, I was really struck by buildings that were 400 years old. Uh, and the reality of nothing really changed. You know, Later, you know, as I started getting deeper into entrepreneurship and building things, it struck me as like it actually was an unusual thing that your base assumption would be people build stuff. And so yeah. that always stuck with me. Um, what else? Lived in China for a few years. I came back to the States and found myself in banking, financial restructuring, and eventually uh, wanted to go to fintech. Yeah, I'd love to hear about the kind of initial career in banking, because I think there are a lot of people in fintech, myself included, who start off in some kind of banking or traditional financial services. I actually spent my one of my very first rule, roles in a pre-bankruptcy thing, doing SMB credit workouts. And I think you were actually doing actual yes. bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, and I learned a yes. lot. It's one of the best ways to learn credit. And to learn how credit works is to be at the table when things are going poorly. I think it's some of the best training that people can get. I spent um, you know, my first three years of my career uh, looking actually at companies hitting a wall, crashing with your bankruptcy proceedings. I think that the most interesting part about when companies are, are crashing is it forces you to think about are there parts of it that are good? Um, you know, Is there a part of the business that actually should stay a going concern as you turn off the rest? Maybe you could combine different businesses. You know, one of the first um, deals that came through was uh, American Airlines was was bought out of bankruptcy by a, a client we represented, U.S. Airways. Um, and it turned out that if you took the biggest planes and you didn't have them competing against each other in L.A. to New York routes, instead you kind of rerouted some for international flights, the business actually worked. And so it, it forced you to think about on first principles what drove business as well. I, I just found that training so useful. Later, you know, I caught kind of the, the entrepreneurship bug. Could you create software that, 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 that makes lives better? And that, that took me to... Um, you started a company called Paribus with Kareem, I, I, also my co-founder here at Ramp, and that was a savings-oriented app. The idea is you could link your email account, and we would check uh, what you bought online. So if you bought like a TV at Best Buy and the price dropped at that TV um, the next week, you could uh, go to Best Buy and tell them, uh, hey, but price adjustment policy, according to the policy, you owe me $100, could you refund the difference? And uh, it became one of the fastest growing email apps um, you know, ever. And so within a year, we um, had a million customers, sold it to Capital One. I think had we not had the training in sort of thinking through bankruptcy or structuring first principles, I never would have uh, quite gotten into entrepreneurship the way I had. How did you affect that actual transition from going from you know a bank or working in bankruptcy to then actually starting something? So I got interested in, in this idea of price adjustments over a year before we ultimately incorporated Paribus is a company. The way we, we did it was, um, all right, we saw that stores had price adjustment policies. I had um, gotten a few discounts and, and refunds for people. We just tried to figure out, could we turn this into software? And so we actually built the first version in uh, in VBA, um, in Excel. Um, it would go and parse <laughs> out. It was crazy. It was all we knew, right? That's a good place to start if that's the, the tool you know. It was very simple. I mean, we we it was almost some kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine, but we tried to figure out, okay, could you with a minimal amount of data, with an email receipt, get someone a refund and a difference. And so the very first version of it was we asked friends who bought things just to forward us emails. Um, <laughs> yep. We would go first by hand, but then we built a little script to kind of go and pull out, okay, here's the URL, here's the price, and we knew the guarantees. If it was eligible, we would go and uh, you know just go on customer support and ask for the difference. Later, we built an email integration that would go send it. And so we just built little parts of it and tried to stitch it together. And you know, after about a, you know, six, nine months of doing this, um, 
you know, the core things that had to be true for the business to work either, you know, A, we observed like prices are changing a lot. B, um, these policies are everywhere. Um, you know, we had seen that every store carries this and C, like you could build a simple email app. All people had to do was sign up and that was it. I, I think a great initial step for people um, who are thinking about, um, you know, going and building is if you tried to break businesses down to the most simple forms and you were trying to figure out would they work um, is a great way uh, to, to run a business. Talk me through just the kind of um, Paribus journey, how you sold it, uh, and then the kind of story that led led into to Ramp. So at the heart of it, Paribus was a very simple consumer oriented app and it just took off like a, like a, a rocket. I mean, um, there were lots of different phases to figure out how to unlock growth, but the you know, TLDRs, within a year um, of launching, we had almost a million users sending thousands of claims per day back and forth. And it seemed like a great fit for Capital One. So initially we'd approached them around a partnership and it turned into, uh, hey, we shouldn't just work together, but we'd love for you to be a part of, of Capital One. And so in October, 2016, we, we sold and became part of the, the credit card division at um, Capital One. And, you know, I, I think for for me, I mean, first of it was just scaling that, that business. Um, inside of the company yep. you know at, at peak we were processing more than 100 million um, uh, email receipts um, every day um, we were saving customers over 100 million dollars per year um, and just turned a lot about turning data into savings and felt we were just scratching the surface of what we could do yeah i think they said it now has basically 10 million users um on top of kind of the the tech that you guys had built originally we learned a lot about the credit card uh, industry. And, and so we got to learn what were the dynamics um, of, of that industry. And I, I also think I was struck with, with sometimes subtly misaligned incentives. Um, there were a lot of really brilliant people thinking a lot about how do you get customers to spend more money or more points, rewards, that kind of a thing. And we were the savings people. And, you know, we'd, we'd build software to save people money. We'd ask them, did you want points, cash back, something different? And, you know, usually the answer, if you listen deeply enough, came back to this notion of actually wanted more in my uh, in my bank account. Um, um, I didn't want this point. <laughs> These other things I, I wanted. It, I, I wanted more for myself. We got very struck by this idea of like, what if you're card was designed to help you spend less. And a lot of banks talk, worry, talk about publicly is like the, the rising cost of rewards. How do you keep these things down? Yeah. And so it felt like both sides were in some ways, there was uh, uh, customers trying to outsmart the bank to get um, too much value in points. Um, the bank yep. was trying to keep rewards costs down and just felt like there should be this third way. Um, what if ultimately you were aligning your interests with customers? And so, you know, I think after, um, you know, a lot of years they are making sure that Capital One Shopping was off to a, a great start. Um, you know, feeling of, you know, the, the industry was changing and it was possible um, to really start um, a credit card company in a way it hadn't been for 30, 40 years. Uh, we felt like it was time. And so um, we left in uh, actually about four years ago, February of 2019, um, in the following month, incorporated Ramp um, um, to go be that company, and you know today a lot of our value prop in, in some ways it's it's just building great financial products. It's you know truly first class corporate card bill payment reimbursement experience, all that um, you know there. But it's all all these products are built with the fundamental intent of helping customers reduce their spend. And so today the average business is able to cut their spend by about four uh, percent. We also save folks a lot of time. Um, we fully automate other services that. Uh, might be paid. Customers are used to paying for services like Concur, Expensify, Bill.com, and you'll find a better version of those products uh, included in Ramp uh, for free. Um, uh, and we grow and monetize, um, and, and we're able to have a healthy business um, uh, simply by being um, a better product that, that companies choose to use. Yeah, no, I'm curious to hear too, and you started as a, a B2C founder and then ended up doing a B2B app, and that's a path I see a lot of founders taking. Uh, and so I'm curious why you ended up in that space versus maybe, oh, like consumer credit cards haven't been innovated in. At some level, grass is always greener. Um, you never know what's quite on the other side. The Actually, more experience you have, you're, you're like, oh man, consumer's so hard. Don't want to do that again. <laughs> it's, I think it's a running joke in, in, yeah. in kind of founder circles. But it was two things that were very unique about the market. And some of it was about constraining problems. One, it's the it's the the nature of the losses. Um, uh, in the intensity of it. And so if you take kind of one extreme, you might have like consumer main street and you can look at 10 Ks of, of subprime lenders, you know, where, you know, yep. uh, you might have loss rates in, you know, credit card portfolios of like five, 10% of, of every dollar going out, like you may lose and you try to make it up in interest. Corporate yep. cards are at the other extreme. Um, if you look at Amex, um, you know, their loss rates are 
uh, closer to 10, 20 basis points. Like it is like two orders of magnitude uh, yeah. less. And so if you're thinking about a business where in order to make a dollar, you need to put a hundred out, um, uh, being able to um, reduce the number of steps of can you make a product people want to use versus can you make a product people want to use and not lose money on it was like one big, big part of it. I think the second big part of it um, has to do with just like the regulatory um, regime and the ability to move very, very rapidly. Yep. I think there's a lot of great reasons uh, that consumer financial products are regulated very, very closely. The barriers to entry are very extreme uh, in 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 uh, the consumer world. In the ability to iterate, um, there are so many more checks and balances um, in terms of launching every new product. And so when you sort of think about, okay, you have uh, a sophisticated you know, company uh, on one side trying to go and create software and you have a sophisticated buyer, you yeah. have a business entity on the other side, it allows you to move more rapidly knowing both parties have the level of financial knowledge to, to move. I think a lot of the financial services world has been deeply uninnovative. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think some of this has sort of been by design, others it's sort of been by regulatory capture um, where the large companies don't have an interest to iterate very, very rapidly. And the space that we felt we could do the most in the shortest amount of time uh, was in the B2B world and do so in a yep. way that was uh, safer and for consumers, safer um, for, for us as well. So 2019, you decide to start Ramp. What do you have to build to get your MVP ready to then get your first customer live? Yeah, so first, we're obsessed with this question of, okay, um, we want to help companies spend less, um, uh, spend less money. And there were parts of spend less time that became more pronounced over time. So one of the problems we had at Paribus was we could see money movement, but we couldn't really change it. The best we could do was write a ticket into support, but you couldn't change the behavior yep. of the card. And so one of our early hypotheses was, what if you had a card with some of these built-in logics where if you wanted to stop spending, you could block a merchant. Um, or if you wanted to save folks money, if you could automate some of the accounting and feedback loop, people could understand their transactions. Mm -hmm. So our early hypothesis was we would need to build a card. In order to have a card, we probably would need to be able to fund it, load funds and currency into it. So we need to have a little bit of capital markets, a little bit of, of risk function, and a bit of just the mechanical authorization layer of it. What we first did was prior to bringing on a single customer, we spoke with, um, I think it was about 100 different founders and finance teams. Um, and rather than trying to go and sell them on, we've got this new credit card, it'll save you money, would you try it out? It was, hey, like, uh, we're building a credit card this design, help you save money. I'd love to go to work for your business and um, you can use me as free labor. I'd love to help find savings in your business. Where do you feel like you're spending too much? And it led us down to a very quick path of, okay, we need to be able to do basic credit cards, do KYC, um, do a level of authorization um, in order to kind of run this workflow, which is what every finance team was telling us. The trouble was not getting a card. They could do that. The trouble was closing their books fast enough. We built kind of light, simple integrations yep. into accounting uh, and started, started triage. I mean, a funny story that people don't, don't know is so for, there was a very first vintage that we of customers we brought on in August of 2019, um, where we were able to load um, funds on to customer accounts. We had assumed that by the end, it was a 30 day charge card, um, we should be able to collect the funds. We have to do it within 30 days. Uh, and we assumed we'd have it done by the end of the month. Um, uh, and we built it in that way where you could go and have the funds go out so long as we were ready 30 days later to go collect it, you can do it. And so you could kind of lay out if you're trying to move quickly, what parts of the tracks need to be laid before the train runs over it. Um, and that was how we approached it. And then talk about the infrastructure too. Like how hard was it to go out and find someone to do a business credit program? Or did you even start with business credit or did you have to start with a, a different construct before evolving into that? The initial program was actually... Um, um, a, a bit more of like an advanced pre prepaid uh, model where the yep. way that we were doing this prior to, uh, I mean, our first credit, you know, bin, it was a, it was a, a commercial bin um, uh, where on the back end mechanically, and I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, I think Marquetta is, is famous for, for inventing this construct, but it was, um, we'd work with them and, and it was a, a just in time uh, funded uh, program effectively it was a program where we would prepay what we assumed the next week, two weeks, whatever might be of, of purchases. Um, when a, an authorization request came through on a card, um, we were plugged in to receive that request and we could approve or deny based off of credit rules we had put in place or merchant rules, card rules that our customers had put in place. And if it was approved, we would release and disperse the funds. And so unlike credit programs where 
Um, there's a receivable created and we need to fund it the next day or later after it's being done. Um, uh, yeah. You know, we early on would take on and pre-fund liability. And so um, that program evolved into, um, you know, what very quickly became a, a 30 day charge card program to today, <clears throat> there's, you know, uh, much more interesting mechanics um, where it's, it's not just a you know, pocket of funds funding everything. And, and talk to me about onboarding your very first customer and, and what that story was. So um, there was a cohort, I think, of uh, four customers that we brought on uh, in, I think it was the second week of, of August 2019. And look, I, I think in a lot of ways, like going from like building and you have this notion of like what you think you need to build to you've got a customer and they're using it, and you've got problems. Um, I think is one of the most important, like important moments for us. We were trying to test certain things. How do you support like an e-commerce company? How do you support um, someone with a lot of physical purchases and cross-border purchases? Could our receipt ma matching work not just in English, but in Spanish? Uh, there was another company that um, would have um, uh, a reasonable degree of returns of goods. We wanted to make sure we are tested the pipes of all sorts of card uh, behavior, um, receipt matching behavior, and then you know, specific kind of accounting. And so all these companies look similar in some way, but there was something new we were learning with each um, and testing on with uh, with all these customers. And that sounds like actually a very complicated set of initial four customers. So I'm sure you were learning yeah. learning a lot. Yeah. Um, was that an intention? Did you kind of gate then for a certain period of time running an alpha or a beta? Yes. And how did you decide when you were ready to open it up more broadly? Yeah, so... Um, we ran in this kind of weird format from, I think it was August 2019 through February 2020 um, when we finally did a public launch. And I mean, there, there was a few gating items for us. The first was, could a business predictably, calmly, easily like run their business on it? No problem. The next, the important criteria we were trying to hold ourselves accountable to is, does this actually save money um, for customers? You know, almost none of our competitors actually measure the outcomes. Um, you know, they don't say how much money they've saved, how much time they've saved, or the impact that it's had. Yep. And, and we need to be able to demonstrably say, not just what we've saved in aggregate, but there's some customers who have saved hundreds of thousands. And so we wanted to build up that inventory to be able to go, um, you know, to market. And, and last, we were able to launch with a very different story. Um, it wasn't just, hey, that you can go and buy things, but there's something different about these product about this product. And so once we had hit that, you know, we had tested different versions of landing pages, marketing was clean. We could go through KYC quickly. Um, you know, at scale, we we had the funds ready to support taking on hundreds of new businesses. That's when you decided it was time to go. Starting in 2019, you raised your first round of funding, which was a seed financing. That's right. I'd love to hear your perspective on that raise versus your raise when you were a first time founder and what that experience was like. Totally. Um, so I'll give you the ramp version and, I'll, and I'll, I'll contrast it with the very first time. It was very different um, time. The ramp version, it was much more of a of a design process. One of the, the adages that really stuck with me was, you know, if you ask for money, you'll get advice. If you ask for advice, um, you might get money. And the second time that we fundraised, we tried to take this to heart. We didn't go out fundraising. We actually just went and, and, and said, hey, we're building this thing where we'd love to help you. And also we'd love your advice. And a lot of people kind of fell in love with the problem, um, you know, and said, this is really interesting. And these people being customers who would then introduce you to venture folks. So before even talking to, to venture, you know, folks, we spent you know, a lot of times actually with other, um, let's say CEOs and founders, they're running a business, they have different problems to solve, um, uh, you know, in their company. Um, and so we've spoken to angels. And so it came to the point where after, yep. you know, 30, 40 of these conversations, there was like a dozen, um, dozen and a half saying, look, if you do this, like, we would be very interested in using the product. Um, or being a design customer, like help us save money. Um, and by the way, if you, if you put a company together, um, call me, um, I'm interested. And so then later, by the time we were having conversations with, with, with VCs, um, it was okay. We're running this, this card and saving us money. We've got all these people who, um, are ready, um, are curious, or we're, we're, we're we've saved them X amount of dollars. Um, uh, They've had they've had these soft commitments to go and invest, um, and it, at some point we just started to open up a note, and VC said, "Well, like, wait a minute, this is this is interesting. Like, yeah, they they yeah. have customers, they have money, um, they've got a product that's kind of working, and 
Uh, that to me, I, I think is the best pitch. 2019, you get your first customers live, you get the product live in 2020. I would love to hear what the next phase of growth, kind of going from that zero to a hundred billion of revenue, opening up the market, getting out of beta, what that looked like. So we launched in February, 2020, super exciting, right? So this company wants you to spend less. And, and that story was different enough that people were interested in writing about it, talking about it, all that. So we had kind of a big launch. We're based in New York City, so half the team yep. got sick. We didn't know why. Three weeks later, we figured it out when the pandemic kind of kicked off. And uh, very instantly, um, we learned that, that I, there was two things that stuck with us. First, we, we learned what does it mean um, to be a business engaged with risk? Um, you wake up one day and you realize, wow, wait a minute, we have millions of dollars out and we don't know who these people are on the other end of it. And so I think it, it was a kind of a, an interesting crucible moment as we were thinking about what does it mean to have effective risk systems and how do you 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 chase not just purchase volumes from the start, but be thinking about what does it take um, to ensure that as companies are going into free fall as, as states, some states were shutting down business full stop. You know, how do you approach risk properly? So we can talk about that. Um, we had a huge boost in some ways over the next year. Um, or so, because when, when you think about the, the corporate card market, it has been dominated by American Express um, for so many years. I mean, I, I think that they're still over 40% plus of the market. Um, where they have enormous unfair advantages are, you know, um, selling a card, you have great status, they're metal, they're beautiful, you have access to lounges, you have points that translate into great travel benefits and all those things that they are excellent at suddenly didn't matter. Um, um, you were not, you couldn't flex on anybody with a metal card on your kitchen counter. Um, you weren't going to hang out in a travel lounge and you weren't going to book any award travel um, using points. And so suddenly it leveled the playing field and our pitches around saving you money. One of the main players just got sort of defanged. And so those were, I think, the two the big challenge and opportunity we took on. There were some opinionated decisions that we were trying to make too um, that, um, uh, slowed us at the beginning, but allowed us to go faster later. I, and and, and um, I think one example of that, um, where once we cracked it, things really started picking up, um, was most of our competitors all integrated with other expense management software, um, with like Expensify, Concur, all that. And this pain point that we kept hearing was, you know, the card's fine, but like no one turns the receipts in on time, the sort of obnoxious. And we said, okay, well, we're not gonna integrate, um, we're gonna build our own and, and go faster. And that actually turned off a lot of business for a long time when people just said, I'm not using you, I'm an accountant, I don't have time for this. It took us a lot of months to actually get it to the point where truly we could show and go to a customer and say, not only is this robust and you can have your audits rely on this process, but you can integrate with Expensify and pay X amount per, per month and you know enjoy receipts that are turning like a month later um, for, for most customers we talk to, or you could use ramp and, and have your receipts turn within 30 minutes, uh, or less is, is the average. And that, um, once we finally were able to get really the product clean enough, simple enough, streamline enough and, and have the opinion and decision point pay off, we were then ready to scale. But 2020 was a, was an interesting year. We'd love to hear if there are any kind of bumps along the roads or like key product unlocks and features that you had to build or release or, or new infrastructure providers you had to swap out um, to help scale on as you continued to grow? Look, I think um, I think that a lot of the most interesting products that we built has been around just being very deliberate and, and, uh, and consistent around looking for pain and, and for problems. Um, I think... Um, when people are building, often it's a painful enough experience. Often you're trying to see what people like, what's going well. And I, I think usually the, the breakthrough moments in our product have been, we're trying to discover when people are very unhappy with either a part of ramp or an adjacency. And so both the replacement of, you know, us fully building expense management and streamlining that and us ultimately going to bill pay, which is our like an extraordinarily rapidly growing product. Um, you know, ramp came out of, yep. you know, NPS surveys and, and actually going to customers and asking if there's one part of your financial stack that you wish ramp could replace, what is it? And both of these rose to the top. And so some of this is doing this in aggregate. Some of it is actually yep. um, calling up customers frequently enough and and being open to having some ring you out. One of our, our key customers, this was probably a year and a half ago, and they, they called and said, We're, we are about to leave. And the, the issue 
that they were having was, you know, they have um, lots of contractors, different employees with different different status. And, you know, we had uh, built a lightweight reimbursement product um, that was easy to approve one or two. And suddenly we had a thousand people plus in that um you know, you need to be ready for folks who are uh, going to grow out um, of, of, of your product. Uh, and it was a huge blessing, right? Like, I, I think them saying like that starkly, if this isn't fixed very rapidly, like we're going to go force us to sort of get out of our heads of pie in the sky, things we can build to these are real customers with problems today. And if we don't, you know, resolve it, uh, you know, one, we'll lose a customer, but two, I think the reality from people building products is Whatever you hear in a, in a bad customer support ticket, you have to assume there's 10 times as many customers who have that issue and will churn. And today, when we look back at the financial profile of Ramp as a business, one of the most defining features of it is we have almost no churn. And that's happened by solving mm -hmm. not just for the new stuff, but making sure that as people are having issues, we're faster, we're responsive, we're thinking, and we're making our product robust so that as companies scale, they don't leave. I think now you do global payouts in like 100 plus countries or something like that. I don't know if that's related or, or a separate. It is related. Problem. You know, there's some companies that are going to have the high number of reimbursements. And, you know, we, we've st started to view it not as a second class product, but, you know, allowing people to review multiple reimbursements to automatically batch. Um, um, to automate more of the accounting and just, you know, have that experience, even though it's not where we started be truly first class was important and eventually did lead into, uh, I think we do reimbursements in 176 countries, you know, today in 80 currencies. And so mm -hmm. um, it's come a long way. Yeah. One of the other big parts of scaling is scaling mm -hmm. your team, uh, especially your executive yeah. team. I'd love to hear your perspective on that because the team that might be right at one point in the company's growth may not be later. So what does it look like for you to build out the executive function uh, at RAMP. And what are your thoughts thoughts there on how to hire executives? It is a con I mean, it's a constant thing, right? So first, I think there's one part of it, which is like finding executives, then the other, it's like, how do you deal with executives who maybe fit exactly the problem you're looking for? And so, I mean, the first is just actually dedicating a lot of cycles to it. You know, a heavy portion of both how our company is spending resources and time, but also even for me, how I'm spending my time is, is trying to find extraordinary people. Because I, I think, well, there are great people who apply sometimes for roles, often the very best people are not looking. As we're thinking about what we need for, for our company, just try to constantly be asking people for advice who's the best, you know, um, you know, mind and marketing you've ever met or who have you learned the most from and, and try to network and ask people for advice and sort of see who keeps coming back up. I think sometimes the mistake that people make in recruiting is they'll look for really high flying companies and, and great logos. And well, I mean, let's say you went for uh, I don't have anything against Salesforce, but I think what makes Salesforce great is not, um, you know, they have the most unbelievable engineers of all time there, um, right? Um, uh, you probably, if you want to go to Salesforce, they have really great marketers and I think fairly good sales sales folks, like people in sales. And so you want to be thinking about like, what are the companies you look up to most in a function and hire both from companies who are great at that in that function, try to diagnose and learn what were they great at and also make sure you have the right vintage. Um, you know, there's some companies where, you know, the time to be hiring from this company was, you know, maybe just sports analogy, like the, the 90s Bulls were great. Um, I'm sure it would be nice to have a player from like the 2010 Chicago Bulls, but like you're not going to get Michael Jordan or, or Dennis Rodman or anything from it. And so sort of trying to think about even in company building, how do you find um, organizations that are great at what they do? Make sure you have the right function and the right like timeline and lineage and try to recruit out of that. And so thinking in that way helps, you know, I think, in finding really, really um, extraordinary people in certain functions. And last ones, you have people, um, you know, look, I, I think um, uh, two sets of things. One, often people are good at moments in time. Like you, you hear sounds about like the sales leader who's really good at going from like, you know, 10 million to 100 million. But once you go to 100 million to a billion, it's a different ballgame. Yep. And so helping people see around corners uh, and then when you see people getting close to that, trying to get smart, get advice and push people to be ready for what's coming next. And I think a lot of very effective leadership and executive management um, is making sure they're present for, for the problem that they're, they're trying to resolve. It's holding each other to high standards and looking around the corner to make sure folks are, are scaling. And then if it doesn't work, um, making sure it's clear to both parties, like what was the criteria that, that is being hit or miss and um, just dealing with it. And ethically and, and, and well. Uh, I'm curious how geography plays into your talent strategy um, and whether you think about ecosystems like San Francisco, New York, Miami, elsewhere, 
or if you're really thinking more primarily remote. So I, in some ways, we were always kind of permanently scrambled. We were 20 people in March of 2020, and we're about 440, 450 people today. Um, and um, so, so most of what we hired was in the pandemic. Um, we are um, about half in New York City, half everywhere else. There are clusters. There's a few geos where people get together. Um, I don't um, solve specifically around certain geos. Like we try to first figure out who are great people. And then, you know, look, there's some functions where, um, you know, your effectiveness as a leader is going to be how well do you interact with these other organizations? Um, and can you help your team get connectivity? And so I'll put it this way, I put it, we put a higher barrier of if someone is not going to be in New York, um, uh, you know, I think we make much more of the interview process around, like, how do you deal with like, um, you know, teams that are in different mm -hmm. places, how do you manage remotely? And I think sometimes it, it, it weeds folks out who are, I'm not interested in that. And other folks who say like, actually, I think it's going to be challenging, uh, but I'm up for it. And so that, that's about where we're at today. We try to solve for the talent versus the, the location uh, primarily. No, that makes sense. And there are two other things yeah. I'd like to touch on. The, the first is just what, what's next for ramp as much as we've grown, um, this industry is so large. I mean, I think if you, you add in all of the new players uh, in the space, our you know our market share at Ramp alone probably runs closer to zero percent than one percent. We're we're excited to go to to one and beyond. And so some of this is just simple growth, taking what is a a truly revolutionary, better expense management experience, and scaling that, growing the amount of savings. When we launched, um, the average customer could expect to cut their expenses by about 2%. Today, that's about four. Um, we envision that getting to five to six and continuing yep. to up the degree in which um, folks can cut unnecessary budget out um, you know, of their, their expenses. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, there's much heavier in workflow uh, automation, process automation, as we're moving um, over a billion dollars a month in, in funds for, for customers, you know, across cards, bill payments, um, uh, reimbursements, you name it. Um, increasing the degree of both control up front, the, fun, the accounting, um, financial automation, workflow automation through it. You'll see a lot there. Um, I've always been very interested in um, using data to, to help customers. Um, uh, we now have a very healthy re repository of, of, of all that. And so um, just as we were able to help consumers save over 100 million a year, um, you know, on, on uh, retail purchases, I think we can do a lot more and a lot better of uh, starting to surface that back out uh, to customers and benefit from, uh, you know, the wisdom of the crowd and what we're seeing. And so um, I know I'm being a, a little quiet on all this, but um, I, I think some of the most interesting stuff we've ever launched is uh, uh, is coming uh, this year. So I... Uh, um, I'm excited. Yeah, if you're doing over a billion dollars in monthly stuff, there's there's just a lot of things, right? Usually there is no silver bullet at that point. It's a lot of lead bullets, a lot of little things that move the needle for larger, more enterprise-oriented clients. And and that's exciting, but it's a different kind of story to tell. Well, and it's it's also too, I mean, I'll put it this way. I mean, we support and now, um, you know, uh, you know, the dozens of, of publicly traded companies in large scale. And uh, I'll put it this way. Um, you know, the rates that some of the very large companies are, are getting from software vendors are a lot, sometimes a lot lower, um, sometimes a lot better, in some cases, you know, a lot worse. Um, but there is an incredible amount of price discrimination. There is an incredible amount of, of things that we're seeing in patterns that we can surface up to help companies with lighter finance teams, accounting teams, automate more of their workflows based off of things that uh, Ramp as an organization yep. can can learn and bring back and, and build into the software uh, to even to uh, data insights and intelligence that we can bring back to companies so that uh, you benefit um, you know, from uh, the knowledge uh, of what's happening broadly. And so um, uh, I'm very excited. I, I, I think it's uh, I think we're finally at the scale where we can do the stuff that I, I've really wanted to do for a lot of years. That is is exciting. Uh, and then last question, uh, any advice that you have for entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting something? I really think this notion of building with potential customers and for people is all you need to do. You know, the reality is like one, you don't need to worry about market share or competitors or anything all that much. Like the, the question really is, is there one person or two or 10, like not that many people out there who you can help today and, and do they value enough to pay for your, your services or advice and want to do more work with you. And so I think rather than trying to solve the market um, and trying to take on uh, and outwit um, what's happening in the world, find like a few people who you can help this week. Um, 
uh, in, in, in iterate. That'd be my, my advice. Great. That's a great point to end on. Thanks so much for coming on, Eric. Thanks, Rex. I really appreciate it.